It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Now, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting if you just email me directly at OppermanInvestigations at gmail.com. Really excited about today's show. We have Stephen, or Sean. We have Sean Howe. You can find him at Twitter at Sean Howe, and that's H-O-W-E. Now, you could find him on his website is SeanHow.com. The book we're talking about today is Agents of Chaos, Thomas King Facade, High Times and the Paranoid End of the 70s. I read a, a chapter of this book in the Rolling Stone. It's an excellent book. This guy's an excellent writer. He captures the time. As you know, I have some connections to this story. Uh, but Sean Howe, are you there? I'm here. Hey, man, thank you so much. Before we get into your book, uh, Agents of Chaos, Thomas King for son, tell us about yourself. Who is uh, Sean Howe? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm a writer in my 40s. Uh, I wrote a book before this called Marvel Comics, The Untold Story. And uh, when I finished that book, I thought that was kind of a kind of a big, wide ranging history. Maybe I'll I'll bite off a little less this time. And it turned out that this book took me about four times as long to write. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm I'm emerging from hibernation with this with this book. And, and how has the book been received? Because from, from my perspective, you know, like growing up in that time in that neighborhood, uh, I think, boy, boy, we were such obscure people. Like, who would even want to read about us back then? We thought we were nobodies, you know. <laughs> and, and now to have a guy write a book about this, like it's history, you know. Like, how, how's the book being received? Uh, it's you know getting really uh, nice reviews. People are telling me they love it. Um, you know that's it's it's just come out. Um, there was an excerpt in Rolling Stone. Uh, there was an ex- excerpt in Reason magazine. Oh really? Uh, so trying trying to reach all the different uh, political <laughs> polls that I can. Um, and and it's it's been really terrific talking to you know people who who were there. Um, you know some I, I spoke to a lot of people for the book but I, i'm i'm now getting you know a few stories that i had never heard before and uh it's it's great to hear people say like this this really takes me back to what it was like yeah i heard about the book through truanon you know because i subscribed to their uh, they sent me their um, i guess i'm on their mailing list or yeah. something <laughs> and i heard about it that yeah. way and it's really rare for me to, to find a guest on another show and say hey let me interview that guest but i just love this topic um now people can meet sean howe in person if they go to the uh, october 2nd at 7 p.m in los angeles at the stories book and cafe uh, and also to October 6th. He's going to be driving around this guy or flying, I guess. October 6th uh, at 6.30 p.m. in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the Changing Hands Bookstore. Uh, are you flying or driving? I think I'm going to fly, hmm. although it would be a really nice drive. Uh, just just that way I can, I can stay in, in Los Angeles a little bit longer and, and see some friends. It is a nice drive. You clear your head out in those deserts, man. I love that drive. I spent a lot of time. I have made the drive. Like Tom yeah. Prasad, I spent a lot of time in Arizona myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start with this, man. So the book is, is mainly about Tom Prasad or all the hippies? I would say it's mainly about Prasad, but, um, you know, I, I came across his story or I came across uh, the outlines of his story and I was like, who is this guy that I've never heard of that seems to have had a hand in so many different subcultures, you know, from the underground press to, you know, major magazine of the 1970s, High Times, um, the punk rock movement. He was very active in fighting for journalists' rights. Um, and yet, you know, I, I'm interested in all of these things, but I had never heard his name. And the more I, the more I learned about him, the more intrigued I was because he was such a, a man of mystery. Um, so there would be these adventures that he would pop up in and, you know, he would be, you know, alongside Hunter S. Thompson or Johnny Rotten. But uh, there was also so much that was kind of under a veil about him. Um, and as, as I, as I kept finding out more about him, I realized, you know, he might be a good way to talk about the 1970s, in a in a larger um, 
spectrum. And, uh, you know, there's there's kind of this story of the 1970s that kind of skips from, you know, Altamont was the death of the 60s. And then we had Watergate and we had uh, gas lines and then Reagan came along. And there's there's really not much to connect the 60s and the 80s. And so I wanted to sort of maybe fill in some of the gaps of that history. Yeah, and what a time to live in New York, man, during that, that period of time. And Chelsea Hotel, you know, and the uh, Lower East Side uh, with CBGBs, all that, all that stuff, man. Uh, but and, and it's fascinating, too, because, you know, Tom Fassad tragically took his life uh, the day before Jonestown. Right, right. So uh, there were, yeah, people I spoke to who remember those two events, you know, finding out about Tom's death um, and hearing about Jonestown on the radio. And uh, it was, I think, a week before uh, Harvey Milk was killed. So there was this convergence right. of really terrible news. Um, and, a, and a lot of it was, you know, you could you could say that all of these things were sort of ends of, of errors in a way. Um, so, uh, yeah, 1978 came to seem to me like, um, you know, the like the the final end of the 60s in a way yeah uh so tell us who who was tom Frasad? tell us about this man so so the the guy that we know is tom Frasad just kind of emerged on the radical scene um in the at the end of the 60s when there was uh, a lot of factionalism going on um you know sds was splitting into different camps um SNCC had had split up into different camps. Um, underground newspapers were kind of fighting with each other over who was more of a sellout. Um, and this is, of course, you know, just after Chicago, nineteen sixty eight. So, um, you know, the the left and the center left are are, are really also at odds. And Forsad comes on the scene and. He immediately arouses suspicion from everyone. Um, yeah, I, I open with a, a scene um, in in Buffalo at a drug symposium, and you know Timothy Leary and Abby Hoffman and the MC5, um, Allen Ginsberg, all these people are are in this hotel room, and Forsad, you know, comes into the room, throws a gun on the bed, and announces that he's the head of the underground press syndicate. And the way that I heard the story was everybody kind of turned to each other and said, "Uh oh, this guy's an agent. And that's kind of the the amount of uh, suspicion (laughs) that was that was normal that he would he would arouse. Um, So even as he he took over um, running the underground press syndicate was, you know, this this organization that coordinated between all of the different underground newspapers around the country. And so he was kind of in a position to manage all of this stuff. And he was traveling around the country, meeting people at different underground newspapers. And uh, he was kind of insinuating himself with the leadership of the anti-war movement, um, the countercultural movement. Um, But a lot of people just did not trust the guy, kept him at an arm's length. But he still was kind of, uh, I guess, accruing power and influence. Uh, let me ask you uh, a quick so, question. Yeah. You, you tell the story about him walking into the room, throwing a gun down, uh, but it seems like everyone else in that room is dead. Every other thing you mentioned, <laughs> you know, Larry, they're all gone now. Uh, Abby Huffman, they're all dead. Who, who told you that story? You know, that, that story came from um, someone who is no longer alive. Uh, that was an interview that um, Ken Kelly, who was a White Panther, right. um, and then later a, a kind of a prominent journalist uh, for Playboy and other places, uh, Ken Kelly told that story, um, and and he, you know, was was remembering. He was one of the people who was especially suspicious of of Forsad. Um and and uh, uh, a lot of this, you know, this story had to be told through. Um, archival materials uh you know i talked to i think more than 150 people and yet so much of the information also came from you know microfilmed <laughs> underground newspapers and also some uh some interviews that 
people before me had done. Uh, there were about three people who had tried to do a book about Forsad over the years, and none of those uh, were ever finished. Uh, some were barely started. Um, so, so it was a lot of um, you know hearing the voices of, of people who are no longer around. Um, uh, and you know, th- thankfully, thankfully there were records of, of these conversations. And now, who were your sources? Did you talk to people like A.J. Weberman? Yeah, I talked to uh, a lot of the um, the Zippies, um, who uh, you know your listeners may or may not know were sort of an offshoot of, of the uh, the original Yippies. Um, uh, they were kind of uh, formed in uh, opposition to what they believed was the the selling out of of Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman. Mm-hmm. Uh, they thought that the Yippies had had gone too mainstream, gotten too cozy with the establishment. Um, and so these zippies like A.J. Weberman, Dana Beal, Aaron Kay, um, they they were sort of, uh, you know, more outrageous than the yippies had been. And uh, I spend quite a bit of time talking in the book about uh, their the confrontations between those two groups um, at the uh, presidential uh, uh, com- uh, conventions of the 19... 19- of 1972. Uh, the Democrats and the Republicans both held their conventions in Miami. So uh, there was a whole summer of, of fighting between, between the groups. Uh, so I talked to a lot of Zippies. Um, uh, I talked to a lot of people at High Times. I talked to people in the underground press world. I talked to some people who had uh, smuggled drugs with Forsad and uh, even talked to a couple of uh, police uh, undercover agents. Huh. So uh, much like you know, Tom Fursad really compartmentalized his life, and uh, so I had to. I had about you know a dozen different groups of people that I had to talk to individually because each of them only knew you know part of the story. Uh, Richard Stratton. I spoke to him a little bit uh, early on. Yeah. Okay. He uh, he, he was uh, involved in some smuggling as well and then later of course became involved in high times oh my goodness <laughs> okay. now, what about uh, uh steve hager uh, what, what about it did, did he contribute because he seems to feel he's the keeper of the uh tom Fursad story uh did he cooperate I've, I've spoken to steve hager but i you know i really was was concentrating on people who knew Fursad or were you know kind of around uh at the time um you know Fursad died in 1978 so um, you know, there are a lot of people who who are maybe one degree removed from Forsad right. and who also have have really um, contributed to, uh, you know, kind of the legend of, of Don Forsad, keeping that alive. Um, but I, I wanted to get um, I wanted to get as many direct experience stories as I could. Um, John Holmstrom is, a, is another person who. Uh, you know, he he had done a great deal of research um, in writing articles on Forsad. John Holmstrom, the co-founder of Punk Magazine, yeah. um, and later a High Times editor, and he had some tremendous stories about you know traveling on the um, the Sex Pistols American tour uh, with Forsad. Um, although traveling separate in separate transportation because Forsad, <laughs> you know, needed to keep his his distance, his mystery. Now, now you, you mentioned off the air, we were talking briefly about Dana Beal, show, who was the head of the Yippies when I was around there. Uh, you mentioned that Dana Beal showed up at one of your book signings and kind of comment, uh, not unlike Dana Beal, commandeered the microphone <laughs> and took over. Uh, right. Yeah. How, does he, how, does he, uh, how did he receive your book? You know, I don't think that he has read it. Right. I offered to give him a copy of the book <laughs> uh, after the reading and he said he was he was interested and he said another time so um he actually sent me his, his address so i will i will be sending him a, a a copy of of the book he you know he certainly you know plays a big enough role in the book and he was helpful uh you know in in connecting some some stories for me um uh but uh yeah i was i was uh thrilled before we we started recording that you know you were saying that you were um kind of exposed to a lot of those 
a lot of those same characters. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, which brings me to the question, because you mentioned the, the, this incident where he showed up with Abby Hoffman and uh, Timothy Leary there, and he throws his gun down, um, and people right away assumed he was an agent. Now, that there's uh, how much of that is covered? Not just him being an agent, uh, but that all the paranoia that went on with this crew. Um, you can't blame them. All the marijuana, the smoke, it makes you paranoid, and all the, the surveillance and infiltration that did really go on. Uh, how much of the infiltration, the Coenzel Pro, the agents that you cover in your book? Yeah, it's kind of a always present thing. It's not just, you know, Coenzel Pro and the, the CIA program chaos. Um, you know, it's also, um, at the time, uh, you know, there were, there were constantly um, stories coming out yeah. that say the U.S. Army was surveilling citizens. You know, there was there was the Church uh, Commission. So there there were as as the 70s progressed, um, not only were people getting paranoid because of you know maybe their illegal activities or maybe whatever they were smoking, but also they were consistently being reminded that. Um, you know that that there were in fact you know government government agents who were trying trying to uh, go after them and so i think that was a that's a huge part of the book is is really um you know what that uh especially during the nixon years what what that kind of um uh, you know government um surveillance and repression did to the psyches of all of these all of these people um you know, I think it's it's been said before, but really, you know, COINTELPRO was maybe not even most effective as a way to, you know, throw people in jail or get them in front of grand juries. Uh, it was it really just made everyone so freaked out that they suspected everyone else of 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 being a, an agent or compromised in some way. So I, I wanted to I wanted to talk about you know that um, th- that that environment that was so pervasive throughout those years. Yeah. So, and, and so people who were making the allegation that, that the facade might've been an agent, uh, cause when you look back, you know, uh, and you see, well, for side driving around in stolen cars all the time, carrying weapons and tons and tons of marijuana stashed all over Manhattan and everybody getting away with all this. Uh, what do you make of all that? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's very easy to, um, to sort of present this uh, this story of a guy who's clearly uh, working for the government. I mean, he he comes on the scene with uh, this assumed name. His real name was Gary Goodson. Right. He was from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but he 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 comes on the scene. No one's ever heard of this guy. He has no background in the movement, uh, you know, as they call it, uh, and he's suddenly like you know brushing shoulders with with the most influential people of the time you know whether it's like john sinclair of the white panthers or abby hoffman and jerry rubin so he's got this access to all these people then he starts microfilming um with bell and howell all the different underground newspapers um there are several government agencies which then have subscriptions to the underground newspapers and they've got their hands on all that so the people who worked with Forsad at the Underground Press Syndicate even said, well, I couldn't understand, you know, if he wasn't, you know, an agent, why would he be doing this, even as they were working for him? So, uh, you know, then his, as his drug business kind of um, increases, uh, then, then a lot of people question, well, why, you know, why didn't he get arrested? Yeah. And in fact, I could, I could not get any... Um, DEA or or BNDD, the the predecessor agency. I could not get any uh, files through FOIA on on Tom Prasad. Uh, there was there were also allegations that he had plotted to assassinate Nixon in 1972, and so this is talked about in his FBI files. And the Secret Service is, um, you know, part of this conversation. But you know, I could not get any Secret Service files either. Um, on top of that. Um, you know, there are always the, um, you know, the, the people who say, well, high times, that's a perfect way to get, you know, mailing lists of, of all the people buying drugs or drug paraphernalia. 
um, how suspicious you know c- could it be um, so so these are some of the reasons um, and, and and I guess there's also a very key thing he also picked fights with all the other people <laughs> on the left um, that said um, I you know I did not find anything to prove that he was an agent um, I'm not sure I believe he was I think one one really um, plausible theory might be that he was trying to play both sides of the fence. Mm-hmm. Maybe he thought he could, you know, beat uh, government agencies at their own game. Um, but there are tons of circumstantial things that definitely make you stand back and say, what's going on? The day that he first contacted the already existing underground press syndicate. He didn't found the underground press syndicate. He just sort of took it over. The day that he contacted UPS was August 15th, 1967, which happens to be the same day that the CIA's Operation Chaos program began. Really? Um, so I would come across things like that, and I would I would start wondering, is my phone tapped? <laughs> like, what the, am I, how, how, how much should I trust the people I'm talking to? Um, there, you know, you, you you start to see how easily you can you can get paranoid around this stuff. Yeah, once you start questioning, is my phone tapped? It probably is. <laughs> probably <already laughs> is. And that's that's how to stay safe. Um, how many times was this guy arrested? How many arrests did Tom Forsad have in his lifetime? That I know of, I would say maybe four. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And but these were these were situations, you know, one of them was um, possession of LSD in 1969 in Phoenix. Uh, That was thrown out. Uh, Another was later in 1969 um, for uh, desecration of American flag. He wore like a a flag as a hat band at a a press convention. Um, You know, he was bailed out the same day. Um, Those charges were dropped. you know, the the biggest one is a 1972 firebombing charge. You know, that was uh, on the last day of the Republican National Convention in 1972. His truck was pulled over. Um, he was arrested uh, for like a traffic charge. And then months later, the candles that had been in his vehicle um, were, were cited as, as evidence that he had... Uh, plotted to blow something up um and that actually uh got to trial but was thrown out pretty quickly Do we and know- i think it was after that it was after that arrest that Forsad really stopped trying to be a public figure i think that shook him up a little bit uh at the end of 1972 he went kind of quiet for um about a year and a half and then high times emerged in 1974 yeah, very interesting. By the way, do we know who his attorney was uh, for that case? It was uh, uh, the firebombing? I cannot remember at the moment, hey. although it is in the it is in the book. Um, I think um, I think Roger Lowenstein may have may have been the attorney. Because it's interesting, because Jerry Lefcourt you know, was so involved with so many of the Yippie, he was Abby Hoffman's attorney for a long time, but with so many Yippie type cases, and then later on, you mm-hmm. know, working for Jeffrey Epstein, you know, he was part of the Jeffrey Epstein defense in, in Palm Beach. Down, it's just like, how does that happen? You know? Yeah, Jerry Jerry Lefcourt was was representing Abby Hoffman yeah. when Forsyth and Abby Hoffman were were fighting about, you know, who owed who what for steal this book and um and so jerry Lefcourt remember for sod as a very weird uh antagonistic individual not, not surprisingly oh so you did interview Lefcourt about the book i did I, I talked to him yeah okay great okay great. i gotta get this book man <laughs> I get this book. people can <laughs> if people can check it out there's a chapter in rolling stone check that out but if you want to meet uh, uh sean howe in person check him out october 2nd he's gonna be in los angeles at the stories book and cafe and then on october 6th he's gonna be in phoenix but then again october 10th he's gonna be what is that upstate new york uh, andy's new york andy's new york is is far upstate in the, in the Catskills, yeah. And once again, you could find him at, on Twitter at Sean Howe, H-O-W-E, SeanHowe.com, and the book is called uh, uh, 
uh, agents of chaos. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I was just jumping in to say Agents of Chaos. Yeah, Agents of Chaos, Thomas King Fassad, High Times, and the Paranoid End of the 70s. Why don't you get into that whole story about steal this book? Because the joke is that Abby stole the book. <laughs> okay, so why don't you get into right. the whole story? I have an autographed copy, too, of, of Abby Hoffman signing a, an autographed copy of Steal This Book. If anybody wants to make me an offer, I'm, I'm open. <laughs> okay, but tell us the story <laughs> about that, about the story about that, the, the controversy of Steal This Book. Yeah, so uh, it's a it's a it's a pretty complicated story, but I'll I'll try to to give the overview, which is Abby Hoffman had kind of compiled this book of uh, I mean if you if you've read Field this book you you know it's a great book, but um, it's it's kind of a resource uh, uh, for people to uh, you know get free food, get get free everything, um, how to you know beat the fuzz, <laughs> how to um, how to I, I think there's some some phone freaking stuff in there how to get free phone calls um so it's it's like a source book for how to uh break the law it's like a non-violent mostly non-violent anarchist cookbook i guess um so for sod was brought on to work as a, as an editor on it to be the editor of it and to help use his his underground press um distribution network to get the book in the hands of people. Um, you know, at one point, Abby Hoffman did not want to go through the major publishers. He wanted to try to just go through um, an alternative distribution system. So for Saad, uh did some editing on the book. He also contributed. He wrote some of the, um, some of the content. Um, and then they had a fallout over, um, over money. And for Saad threatened a lawsuit, uh, the 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 people around them kind of huddled and said, "Why don't we keep this out of the courts and we'll do kind of a, a people's tribunal? We'll get some you know some people we trust and we'll have a hearing in the you know in the basement of this church and um, and we will make a judgment as to you know as to who owes who what." So this got play in like the New York Times and the New York Post and the Daily News and all the national news magazines. It was a big deal that like Abby Hoffman was, you know, being sued by another counterculture figure for, for, for ripping him off. Mm. Um, but the, the, the long lasting effect of, of this trial, which, you know, kind of the, the outcome was, was sort of muddled. And I think, you know, they, they one of them paid some money and one of them, Paid. So, I think the Abbey ended up giving Forsad like free books that he could then sell. Um, it was it was kind of a draw, but the the real outcome of this was that Forsad really began to hate Abby Hoffman, and this is sort of like the the seed of of you know the forming the Zippies, um, and so. Uh, you know, the Yippies had famously, you know, said, don't trust anyone over 30. And the Zippies were saying, don't trust the Yippies. Mm. Uh, so so this was this was kind of all happening, you know, with the backdrop of the McGovern Nixon campaign. And the Zippies were saying, you know, these guys have endorsed McGovern, their sellouts. Um, and and the Zippies began doing all of these crazy things. Uh, demonstrations and stunts when they were in Miami. Uh, they had like a, for instance, a wheelchairs for Wallace event where they were, you know, pushing a dummy of George Wallace uh, on a wheelchair and then dumping him into the ocean. They, they stole uh, a portrait of, of uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, from the convention center and, you know, kind of uh, vandalized that and carried it around. Um, you know, they were, they were really, uh, going after as much media attention as they could get and really trying to infuriate as many people as they could. What about, because uh, the, the Zippies were like more of a aggressive, I guess you might call it, than, than the old timer yeah. Yippies. Okay. Much, much more street fighters than, than the Yippies were. Uh, more, more portrayed as a peace, peace next, the Yippies, but other than the Zippies later on, a little, a little more active. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. the thing is that there was just so much, 
uh, smuggling and, and, and uh, dealing and distribution going around this whole crowd. Um, so I, I can kind of see how someone like Versace could come in with his background and, and all that kind of power and money and influence and, and being able to manipulate people with, in the drug business uh, could come in and take over, uh, which Abby was doing too as well. They were all dealing. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what? And, and for Saad, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was just going to say that for Saad really sort of was was kind of innovative in, in that world as well. He started, um, you know, what he called uh, smoky Um a, fr- a, fr- a friend of his had had um, had I guess invented this concept. But these were basically, you know, dispensaries, <laughs> illegal dispensaries of of the 1970s. Uh, I guess their, their roots, you know, can kind of go back to like tea pads in Harlem, but um, but in the 1970s, there really wasn't anything equivalent to this, where you you would go into uh, a, a, you know an apartment and they would have like glass jars filled with all of the different uh, kinds of strains of marijuana that you might want. And you could hang out there and sample the wares, and then buy in bulk. Um, so, so for Saad, um, even before High Times started, and in fact, I think this was part of how he funded High Times, um, he was he was kind of um, perfecting the idea of the New York City dispensary. Yeah, and they even had dial a joint. Mickey Cesar had dial a joint, and then a seven seven two one two seven 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 cash <laughs> that you could call up, and the guys on bicycles would come and deliver the marijuana to you. They can go to his little apartment over there at uh, I think it was uh, nine and a half Bleecker Street. It was like a little closet where this guy lived. <laughs> <laughs> you know? The next door you had uh, uh, nine Bleecker Street, which was Yippie headquarters. Across the street was Studio Ten, the nightclub, which was later renamed the Tom Forsyth Multimedia Center. Above that. It was A.J. Weberman, the head of the Jewish Defense Organization and the Yiffies, and John Draper, Captain Crunch, uh, lived up there. <laughs> the crash up there, too. You're right. The phone freak, yeah. So that was, man, what a time. What a time. What a time. Uh, now, now, you mentioned, we talk- talked to- Go ahead. I was just going to say, I talked to John Draper a little bit. Really? And, you know, he was kind of cagey on something that I had heard, which was that Forsad had asked him to- tap the phones at high times um tap people's offices really um and uh, he he said well i don't i i didn't really i might have what did he call it maybe like i might have done a bridge tra- bridge, bridge tap or two um but he 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 didn't really want to confirm that for me <laughs> <laughs> Well, that that's pretty good, man, because I remember being at Studio 10 one time when the phone company showed up because we had all these phone lines and that no one was paying a bill for <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to come in and, and find out what was going on, and we had to kind of like shoo them away. Okay, <laughs> uh, we didn't have time yeah. for Sai there with his weapons, but uh, we we got rid of them uh, quick enough. But w- which brings us to another point, too. Like the, um, I guess, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, like the the. The concert uh, promotion type, like a shakedowns of the concerts, right? Yeah. Okay, what do you got there? T- describe that. Sure. So, um, so Woodstock was was going on just around the time that Forsad was, um, you know, becoming a, a, a well, I was going to say a public face, but he didn't like his face photographed. But the, the, around the time that he was um, he was meeting all of these. Um, these counterculture characters and at the end of the 60s and you know woodstock quite famously you know abby hoffman tried to get up on the stage and make a speech about um it was actually about john sinclair Mm. it was about you know freeing john sinclair from prison for his uh marijuana sentence and uh and pete townsend smashed abby hoffman with his guitar and abby hoffman left the stage so that was kind of you know, a, a demonstration of you know just how how little the the rock and roll scene wanted you know politics <laughs> involved on that level. So what a bunch of people decided to do was in the rock festivals that followed Woodstock, they wanted to to make sure they got a, a cut of the, the profits that they could then put into radical causes. So there was a lot of intimidating promoters. And saying like, look, we we can reach the underground press, um, but you need to give us a cut. 
or in the case of uh, there was a Randall's Island New York Pop Festival uh, where they were, you know, even more demanding um, and, and they wanted, you know, bands from, you know, the, the, the local bands from the Bronx to play and they wanted to be able to play Weather Underground communiques on the PA. Uh, and so I, I talk at some length about um, this Randall's Island uh, fiasco, really, um, the, the, for, for starters, a, a lot of the, the bands were not getting paid, so canceled at the last minute. Um, it was kind of an, a, a much uglier version of, of Woodstock. It wasn't wasn't quite Ultimont, but um, it was it was a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of people, you know, breaking down fences and uh, starting to riot a little bit, and and. Um, one one thing that would have been very interesting had had the bands been playing is there was supposed to be a jam session with like Miles Davis and Jack Bruce and Eric Clapton. Wow. Um, I you know God knows what that would sound like, <laughs> but it never happened. Um, uh, but there's there's uh, there is footage of, of the Randall's Island Festival, and it uh, it looks pretty. It looks like a real downer. So so for Saad. Um, I guess that wasn't even enough. Uh, he also uh, was involved in something called Winter's End, uh, which was similarly uh, a disaster. Uh, they couldn't they couldn't get um, uh, the permissions to hold the festival at the last minute, and uh, that happened down in Florida, also in 1970. And there's you know they talk about police chasing the promoters around a motel pool. And uh, you know, biker biker gang trying to t- trying to rip off all the profits, and Johnny Winter doing so much acid that he was on stage for like four hours. <laughs> yeah, it it was a, a a bizarre collective of young lords and the White Panthers, um, and I I think that's where. Like, by the way, the young lords was Geraldo uh, uh, Rivera. <laughs> Okay, worked for the Young right. Lords and uh, Felipe Luciano right. and Pablo Guzman. All these guys went on to these huge careers in TV and in radio. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was the, the coalition that uh, Forsada put together to shake down. I these think guys. you know, and and there was also the Medicine Ball Caravan, which is uh, right, um, which was 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 a, a way that Warner Brothers thought that they could follow up the Woodstock film success. So they staged a cross country music festival. And got you know a film crew to capture all of this, and Forsad followed this whole thing around and basically disrupted everything. He got David Peel um, to to play on the roof of his Cadillac. Forsad was driving around this tricked out Cadillac, and David Peel would would play songs and heckle the the people who were traveling along with this music festival. Um, you know, there have also been um, hints that maybe Forsad was paid by Warner Brothers. Oh, really? To create a spectacle, um, and Forsad himself was was kind of cagey about that. He 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 wrote something that was kind of, you know, it was almost as though he he didn't want to totally deny this this idea. Uh, so once again, you know, his his intentions are a little bit. Um, uh, a little bit hard to discern um but but there's also yeah this movie the medicine ball caravan um you can see footage of forsad and david peel um you know almost getting into a knife fight with with one of the one of the organizers um and that is definitely the highlight of, of that movie yeah david peel another one just recently passed away in the past few years uh another loss that we've had here um what about uh, his girlfriend uh, Gabrielle Shang? Did you did you did she, she contribute or is she still alive? Yeah, yep, she's she's still around. Um, she was his girlfriend, and 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 they were married in seventy seven. So she's she's actually his widow. Oh, really? Um, and and she had she had come from you know a, a very kind of sheltered background, but then sort of threw herself into radical politics. Um, and she was kind of a little more aligned with the yippie crowd in Miami. Um, and uh, it was it was after 
1972 Zippy Yippy fight. Um, she she later reconnected with Forsad after she'd been working at the Berkeley Barb, and um, uh, you know she she'd been like handling SLA communi- communiques yeah. in Berkeley, and uh, he really um, uh, courted her uh, very aggressively, um, and and uh, they they got together. She moved to New York, and uh, she was involved in. Um, the Underground Press Syndicate became it changed its name to the Alternative Press Syndicate, and so she was she was heavily involved in that. Um, and I think you know there was always a little bit of a, a sort of a standoff vibe between her and some of the Zippies who thought you know that she was more part of the Abby and Jerry group. So well, I think for was, a while she was. was. I think for a while she Actually. was in Miami, right? In Miami, she was. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and and then think, and then she became uh, she was covering the uh, the Patty Hearst kidnapping, and she was receiving uh, cassette tapes, right? And and was like a, a transit for the, the communications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> okay. right, right. And you, know, you think people would be more interested in this kind of stuff, you know, like uh, the High Times guy, you know, and his girlfriend, his wife. I didn't know that was his wife. Yeah, uh, was involved in all this stuff. You, you, no one knows. You know, Geraldo Rivera involved in shaking that. No one knows. You know, there's there's a great um, a, a great little anecdote that I got um, from from someone who was a, a, like a 14 year old. He was kind of like a Cameron Crowe type. He was a 14 year old reporter, yeah. and he was he was trying to do a high school project, and he was calling all these places, trying to get an assignment, and Gabrielle gave him an assignment to write about the zippies for the alternative press syndicates magazine. And so he tells me this story of going over to nine bleaker and these guys kind of like looking out through a slot in the door. Yeah, that's probably me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> and they were, they were like, he said they were really paranoid yeah. about this, like 14 year old kid who wanted to talk to them, but he, he actually had it. Had a nice, uh, you know, time talking to them and wrote a story for it. And uh, anyway, this guy turned out his name's R.J. Cutler, um, and he grew up to be an Oscar-winning documentarian. He made he made that movie, um, uh, the War the War Room about Bill Clinton. Wow. Um, he's uh, he's I mean he's had a very illustrious career, but this was sort of like his his entree into journalism was, was going over to nine bleaker and, uh, and meeting, you know, Darren Dan, Kay Dan, and yeah. Mike Chance and those guys. And now, now what year was that? That was in 76. Yeah. I would have been there. Yeah. Now. Um, and also it's the funniest thing is you talk about this door at nine bleaker. Okay. It was a big giant, thick wooden plywood door. Uh, with, like you said, with a big peephole in it. And when you had to leave some, there was no lock on the outside. You had to lock it from the inside. So someone always had to be locked inside <laughs> to, to guard, yeah. to guard whatever's going on upstairs that we couldn't talk about. <laughs> okay. We're running out of time, though. We're running out of time. I want to hear about uh, the the, the death. There's a lot of conspiracy and and allegations and suspicion about what I believe was a suicide. But what did you conclude? I think so, too. I I, I mean, there are, you know, a a number of theories. And I did speak to, you know, people who knew Tom well, people from high times, people from the political uh, arena. Who, who just said, I, I will never believe it's a suicide. Like, until the day I die, I will never believe that he committed suicide. Um, but um, I, I, tend to, I tend to think that uh, that is what happened. He had a, uh, there was a history, a very deep history of um, depression and, and, you know, bipolar disorder yeah. in his family. Um, you know, I, I get into that going, I mean, I, I go back to uh, you know the the nineteenth uh, century <laughs> talking about some of his his family history, um, and I think you know his his depression was pretty well documented you know by I mean by a lot of people who who knew him. Um, it got a lot worse in seventy eight. Um, his best friend died in a plane crash. Um, in a, in a smuggling operation yeah. that he was, that Forsyth was a part of. 
you know, he was he was also uh, stressed about, you know, Larry Flint had been shot. Larry Flint was the distributor of high times at, the, at, at that moment. And Forsad was worried that people were coming for him. And, uh, you know, he was he was not, you know, being not only was he not being treated properly for his bipolar disorder, but he was well, taking a lot of quaaludes, I think. Um, and uh, he had gone out to Hollywood to try to get Robert Evans involved in making a movie, and that had gone poorly. Um, Evans was only interested in you know, Forsad's cocaine connection. Yeah. So there were a number of things that were really, um, you know, Forsad was sp- spiraling uh, about. Um, and so, you know, as much as someone might, you know, have a theory that, uh, you know, an assassin came through an unlocked window. Yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to think that he shot himself. Yeah, and, and uh, Gabriel Shang was there. No, but Robert Evans. I, I didn't realize he had a connection to Robert Evans, who also has a connection to uh, um, uh, Larry Flint. Well, the, but, I mean, that's, is all that in your book about the connection? Is, that, is Evans in your book? Just just a little bit in that story where. You know, Forsyth has a meeting with yeah. him at 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 Evans' home, and uh, you know, kind of Forsyth sits down and places a vial of cocaine on the center of the coffee table, but doesn't offer it. <laughs> he just sort of lets Evans look at it and right. and salivate over it. Um, you know, a lot of uh, you know, he played a lot of games. He was really into head trips, um, so he was always um, making things a little more maybe uncomfortable than. Than they had to be, yeah. Which was like a pattern among that whole bunch. And Abby Hoffman, Abby Hoffman too, had the same uh, depression, seasonal depression, and the same kind of presence. And Dana, we discussed too. Uh, but now, uh, I think uh, I had mentioned Larry Flint and, and Hustler, and you had something to say. Oh, I was, I was going. I think you were saying there were connections between, you know, uh, Robert Evans and, and Larry Flint, and I was going to say there were so many, uh, you know, the, the, definitely was the kind of book where like you need like index cards yeah. and string and to, you know, have your like board of like what's connected to what, um, there's also some connections between Larry. Fl- there are, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of like Mitch Werbel, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. arms dealer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> we've covered all he that. Was like, yeah, we've covered all that here. He was, yeah, he was connected to, um, a, a guy named Ken Bernstein who, for Saad was in business with in smuggling. Oh, really? So it, there, there are just, you know, I, I mean, I, I had to draw the line with like, I could only get so much into like the Bay of Pigs connections yeah. in this book, but like it, it, it all like, I was, I was dizzy from, from how many things fed into other things. And I tried to, you know, lay it out as, as, uh, as simply as, as possible because, you know, that's a whole world that you can just, you can get really uh, tied up in. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Uh, uh, Larry Flint's bodyguard, Bill Menser, actually uh, did did a murder. <laughs> right, right. And Robert Evans, yeah. And Bill Menser listens to the show, by the way. Okay, he's a fan of the show. We did a show about him and he loves us. Okay, um, what else haven't I asked you, man? we got about three minutes left. What, what else haven't I asked you you really want the audience to know about? i got to get this book. Yeah, I, I recommend everybody yeah. get this book. <laughs> I, um, you know, there's a lot in here uh, that I think is relevant to, you know, things that are going on in the world today about media objectivity. Mm. There's a lot about First Amendment um, press rights. Uh, you, actually, Forsad had a case for press credentials that was used um, as, as precedent in CNN's case against Donald Trump's administration when Jim Acosta couldn't get press uh, rights. They used uh, Tom Forsad's case to to win that. Um, there's a lot about you know the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, um, and there's a lot about just like you know people fighting people of of um, similar political persuasions who are not trusting each other, accusing each other, yeah. and um, and and not really working together. That I think um, in 2023 is is really. Um, it, it, it is, is hugely relevant. Yeah, such a different world. Such a different world. Sean Howe, you could find Sean Howe 
on his website, SeanHow.com. That's spelled H-O-W-E. By the way, he's on Blue Sky, too. He's got like a thousand followers on Blue Sky. I don't know how he pulled that off. But you can find him on Sean Howe and Blue Sky. <laughs> I got like five. I got like five followers on Blue Sky. Uh, I got in early. Yeah, I, I'm sure you did, man. Twitter, you could find him on Twitter, Sean Howe on Twitter. And this book we've been talking about, okay, it's called Agents of Chaos, Thomas King Fursad. High Times and the Paranoid Ends of the 70s. I'm sure we haven't covered everything, but if you just want to check out the first chapter, it's in the uh, Rolling Stone. It's a very well written, man. Covers a lot of, there's a lot of meat in there right there. Uh, he's written another book called The Untold Story about Marvel Comics. Uh, so check that out too as well. You want to meet him in fer- person? Hey, meet him in person. Bring a pie. Throw a pie at the... <laughs> <laughs> Shut out. In memory of Tom Prasad, who invented the pie throwing, by the way, before Aaron Kay. Uh, October 2nd, uh, Los Angeles, 7 p.m., uh, Stories, Book, and Cafe. And then also, to October 6th in Phoenix at the Changing Hands Bookstore, October 10th. He's good. This guy's flying all over the place. Uh, Diamond Hollow Books in uh, Andes, New York. Uh, Tom, Sean Howe, thank you so much. Thank you. No. So great to talk to you. Great stuff, man. Great stuff. I'm really looking forward to, to reading this book. SeanHow.com. Good night, my friend. Good night.